Alcohol Tipping Point is brought to you in partnership with Speak Studios and Speak Boise. Speak Boise is a community-driven studio space where voices from all walks of life can speak and be heard. You can find them on Instagram and Facebook at Speak Studios, Speak Boise, and at their website, speakstudios.com. Speak Studios, speak and be heard. This podcast is also brought to you by Instant Imprints. Promote better with Instant Imprints. Instant Imprints are Boise's visual communications experts and your place for everything you need to promote your business, club, school, or group. As a locally owned business, Instant Imprints specializes in making your organization more visible with custom branded apparel, embroidery, promotional items, print services, and wide format printing for signs, as well as banners and vehicle graphics. Want better ways to get noticed? Visit Instant Imprints at instantimprints.com slash Boise or call 208-IMPRINT. That's 208 467 Seven four six eight. Thank you and welcome back to the Alcohol Tipping Point. I'm your host, Debbie Maisner. And today I have a very special human being, all around amazing person on the show. Um, her name is Bonnie Violet, and Bonnie and I go, Bonnie Violet, I should say, uh, go way back, um, gosh, it's been probably 15 years, uh, to when Bonnie Violet lived in Boise and had was the founder of Alpha here, which is Allies Link for the Prevention of HIV and AIDS. And when I was starting out in nursing at the VA, I volunteered with the Alpha organization, And then I rediscovered Bonnie Violet recently um, and have followed her story. Um, She's just an amazing human being, like I said. Bonnie Violet is a transgender, queer, spiritual drag artist, and digital chaplain. And I'm super excited to have you on the show, Bonnie Violet. So thank you. Hi, Deb. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here as well. So uh, tell me a little bit, you know, first of all, where are you calling from? Um, I'm currently living in the lower height of San Francisco. So, I've been here for a few years now. Yeah, so a small town Idaho person who has kind of made a big journey in your life. Can you tell me a little bit about your recovery journey and, and your experience with addiction, and whatever you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so um, I grew up in a home where um, there were lots of drugs and alcohol when I was a kid. Um, there were a lot, there was drugs and alcohol. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and um, I don't remember a lot of my childhood um, directly. Um, until about the age of 12, but I know that it did impact my life in some pretty um, big ways. Um, I, um, it's been interesting to like coming to, under, like as you get older, as I get older and start looking at things, your story just becomes a little bit more fuller. Like you come to understand things a little bit more. And um, in my childhood, I, um, I was a very effeminate uh, boy. I was very soft. I, you know, I, I would always get yelled at by my father for like putting my hand on my face or not sitting correctly or, and it, it, it created me being this really nervous person. Like I didn't know how to express myself in public. Like I was really, um, I, I was really scared to do anything because I was afraid it was going to be wrong. And, um, so I just learned really quick to keep a lot of things in. Um, and I learned to be very, um, like set like when I'm at school I'm this person and I I act this way when I'm at home I act this way and for me church was a really big part and at church was where I could be a little bit more free um drugs and alcohol was something I never I always felt like my dad drank drank and used because he had a hard life and he experienced a lot more violence and things as a young person that I did not experience and so I never really thought I had a reason to drink or drug um I did die of alcohol poisoning when I was 16. 
Um, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing, and I lied to my parents and went out and drank. Uh, a, a, uh, shared a like a fifth of black velvet with my cousin, and ended up getting you know t- carried away in an ambulance and getting my stomach pumped, and it was it was quite the quite the experience, but. Um, I didn't really think I had a problem at that time. Nobody would really drink with me um, after that. So I didn't drink much after that. Um, but so, and I really didn't until, um, so for me, drugs and alcohol, I think even my belief was, is that it was about, um, it was more of like a medicine, I guess. It was more of something to kind of like help me with life and, um, I didn't really ha- I didn't really drink or do anything like that. Um, when I was 19 years old, I was infected with HIV, um, and that was a very uh, traumatic experience for me. It was 1999, but I had an education of AIDS as if it was like 1981. Mm-hmm. So I was definitely scared that I was going to die, um, and that was not what I had planned. Um, I grew up in a <laughs> trailer in a little town and from a poor family and I was, I had the opportunity to actually go to college and like, it seemed like I had an opportunity to do more than what anyone else had had an opportunity to do in some ways, you know, like we all have our own paths or whatever, but mine was actually let, let, like took me out of the town. And, um, I had realized that, um, I wasn't going to be able to do all of that. You know, I wasn't going to be able to be a success in whatever way it was. Um, and it was a really hard pill for me to swallow um, I, at that time I was really active in church. Um, I was a total Jesus freak. (laughs) Um, and then, um, but when I, when all of a sudden I became, um, a faggot with AIDS, I use that word because that was kind of my, my feelings on myself. And at that time I didn't have a really good idea of like, being a faggot you know like that was a derogatory term and I felt really um I just felt really bad about myself um and I didn't know I felt like I because I got HIV also I felt like there wasn't anything I was going to be able to do to kind of like fix that um so I (laughs) I hope I'm like I um, feel like I'm talking a long time on this oh, little part. I'd, but I appreciate it. And I mean, it <laughs> must have been so lonely for you and, and it, it's scary. Yeah, it was really, it was really difficult for me. Um, Cause I was, I had moved to Phoenix, Arizona. I was living there with an aunt. I had quit going to school to be a pastor. I was super involved in my church and I ended up in my in church had always been like a safe place for me. And then all of a sudden I wasn't able to go to church um, for support and I had no other really support where I was. So it was a very scary thing for me. Um, And I just didn't know a lot. And I was so scared to know more, you know, like I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like it's the less, you know, like the less scary it is or something, which is like totally not, true but that's often how I respond um like I remember just to give you a perspective of my mindset at that time um when I would go into the doctor to see the HIV doctor I would um I would wear the same outfit every time I went and I would wear a pair of bib bib overalls Mm -hmm. and this little shirt from high school and I would put on take a yellow backpack with me which I called my backpack of death And that backpack, I would just, you know, I'd go to the doctor and they'd have all this paperwork and all this stuff for me to read and to learn. And I would just like stuff it in that backpack. And I remember I was, I was probably not people's favorite (laughs) patient, but I was just so scared. And I remember just like sitting there horrified. And I remember a nurse trying to like comfort me. And she said, she was like, isn't it so great that everyone here is just like you? as in it was an HIV clinic. So everybody in the clinic was HIV positive. And I was like, no, (laughs) like that freaks me out. Like I can look around the room and I can see people in wheelchairs and without limbs and that are blind. And I'm like, no, like this is scaring the shit out of me, you know, Um, that this is like, I don't know, this is going to be my future at some point, which is totally dramatic and traumatic. But that was just my understanding and perception at that time. So 
I would usually just then go home, throw that bag of death in the closet, and then not look at it again until it was time to go to the doctor again, and I would pull it out and do that. So um, I had a really hard time coping with life, and I needed something to kind of soften the blow of life. I had finally, if you will, had an experience that justified me drinking and doing drugs. And so I um, so I very consciously started drinking and doing drugs. And um, uh, ecstasy was really like my, my favorite thing in the beginning. I really loved it. It was like the late 90s, early 2000s. So like I was like a raver-esque kind of club scene kid. Um, I really am grateful for that time in my life when I was able to access drugs and alcohol because I do believe that it, um, it, it gave me the ability to live a life that I wasn't able to live on my own. It softened the blow of life enough in which that I could not be scared to die or to not be alive, but it also kind of like loosened me up and allowed me to just have a freedom in the world that I never could experience on my own. You know, like it, it was my medicine in the sense that it helped me it helped me cope and it helped me be comfortable in myself. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. that that's it, it's so effective in, in the short term. It, it does feel good and it mm-hmm. is something that people turn to, especially in your situation where you have this what to you was like a life sentence um, and and struggling with your identity and, and being in a new environment. You know, you weren't even at home. I mean, yeah. I just can't imagine how how scary that was for you. So so that and so when you said you were you found a reason like it was a justifiable reason to use drug and alcohol. Is that wh- what are you referring to? Like when you say that? Yeah, so. I kind of felt like, you know, I'd always, my dad, I always felt like my dad drank and used because he had a reason because Mm -hmm. his life was really hard and difficult. And up until that point, I hadn't really felt, you know, my life was difficult and challenging, but like I was, I was just kind of like excelling anyway, you know? And then I had reached a point where I was like, okay, I really failed. Like I had fucked up and um, because I got HIV, I was going to die and I was not going to achieve all those things for me and my family that we always thought I would, you know? And so I guess I just, to accept that reality or which was just too much for me to bear. Uh, life became hard enough, if you will, in which I needed something to, to help me. Yeah. And my dad always, my dad always said that church was my crutch. He's always said drugs and alcohol was his crutch, I think, for living, and church was mine. And once I lost church, I didn't have that crutch anymore, Mm -hmm. and so drugs and alcohol just kind of became my crutch at that time. Yeah, and and then so then what happened in your story? Well, um, eventually I made it back to Idaho because I wasn't well enough with medications and stuff, so I moved in with my parents at 21. And eventually, you know, I was able to move to Boise. I started sharing my story with HIV. I eventually started a nonprofit organization called Alpha, the one where we met at. Mm -hmm. Um, And through that process of being at Alpha, I really came to love myself and understand that HIV didn't have to be that scary. And I was able to kind of build a community of support and love around it. So I wasn't as worried about death and dying. You know, I was, I wanted to. I started living my life as if I wanted to live, not as if I was afraid to die, Mm -hmm. which just is a slight change. Um, But once I was able to get to that point a few years later, things started to change. And drugs and alcohol were off and on a part of that process for me. Like um, I was, whenever I would get too messy, I would stop and switch a different drug or a different, um, you know, I don't know, I would just switch something up maybe a different boyfriend, (laughs) maybe a different um, drug or alcohol or whatever. Um, And uh, so, so I, I never really, it was interesting because I did, it's such a long story. (laughs) There's just so much that happened. And then there's been so much life since I've gotten in recovery. Mm -hmm. 
but I ended up having a scent with meth. I had been um, gang raped um, by a handful of guys one night, and um, I had been I was drinking that night, and um, I ended up doing um, ecstasy to kind of cope with that within a couple days after that a friend came with me to kind of like support me and we did ecstasy and then I did crystal meth to come down so that I could go to work and then I did crystal for like quite a few months crystal meth and um I even like so I did that and then I quit that and then I like moved back in with my parents again at that time and I got stopped using meth in a trailer in the back (laughs) backyard Mm -hmm. but um I never saw that I had a problem at that time. I just was like, oh, I'm just tired, (laughs) you know, like, um, and so I quit and it was difficult. It was difficult. Um, uh, But I, so then I just stopped using crystal meth, but then my drinking gradually just got worse. And I was still very functional and like being queer and being um, like being queer and being drunk was pretty commonplace and kind of normal. I don't even think that's just a queer thing, but definitely like in the gay community and stuff, like getting drunk or maybe even a little messy Mm -hmm. was just kind of par for the course. Um, Like that's just kind of the norm, social norm, if you will. Um, But eventually toward the end, um, I was about three years running Alpha and um, I just, you know, it was really weird the last night I drank. Um, like I didn't know it wasn't the night I drank the most it wasn't the you know like I didn't know it was going to be the last night I drank um, it was the night before Mother's Day and I um, I went out and at that time my drinking was I could have a drink I could have a drink or two and black out mm-hmm. or I could have 20 drinks and drink for hours and and be perfectly fine like I just never knew what would happen when I drank and when I blacked out that's when things were, were scary. Um, obviously. (laughs) Um, and so one morning I just woke up and I had, uh, slept with, uh, somebody who wasn't my boyfriend at the time. And uh, that was not our arrangement and it was mother's day. And I wasn't, I don't know, just something, something, something just struck that day where I was feeling really shitty about myself. I was feeling like a horrible, a horrible, like, child to my mother and a horrible partner and those were two things that I thought were really important and alpha was doing really well and I was just afraid that I was about to fuck everything up mm-hmm. and so um someone told me that they thought maybe I had a drinking problem and I was like oh that's it like it's the drinking that's why I'm an asshole that's why I do these things like if I just stop drinking then I won't I won't do these things and so when I first got sober, I thought it would be really easy. I just thought I would not drink. I hadn't realized how much of my life had drinking in it. Mm -hmm. Like there were just so many parts of my life that there was drinking. And right away, um, you know, I had my, I would say that I had my bottom about three to six months into sobriety. Um, And for me, I think that was to the point where I could come to enough to where I could actually really see what my life had become and how I had behaved and what had happened to me. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really difficult. I would say that I started to have a lot of pain and it was just a really difficult thing. But luckily I was in the rooms of recovery and I was able to do that with people um, and queer people and addicts and, you know, just... I don't know, people kind of like myself. And then spirituality was brought back into my life um, during that time, which was great because I didn't think I could exist as a queer person, a person living with AIDS, um, you know, and also have like spirituality. And I came to see that I could and um, that that's been really helpful for me to have that part of my life, that part back in my life again. Yeah, but like you said, you grew up as a Jesus freak, <laughs> and yes. you came back. I mean, I think that um, is common for a lot of um, LGBTQIA people is that they feel, I mean, they, they turn away from the church and religion, and the fact that you've brought that back is so 
beautiful because it right. sounds like it's it's such an important part of your life. It was before and it is now. Um, yeah, and it's so unnecessary. Like there's that the way that religion impacted me and LGBTQ folks and not even just like religion, but society as a whole, the fact that we have to hide ourselves Mm -hmm. and like kind of, you know, I I do believe we're as sick as our secrets and it's not like if we, if we have secrets and we have things about us that we can't share, the thing that we can't share is not this, like the sickness, it's the fact that we can't share it. And that's like where the shame sets in. And I think that's, I believe that's why there's a lot of drug and alcohol use with LGBTQ folks um, because we're all of this um, shame is put on us off, you know, by the world, whether it's by church, whether it's by oftentimes family members. um, And eventually then it starts, even we start putting it on ourselves as well. Um, And it can be really difficult to kind of get to a space where you can get through that, that, um, that shame, you know? Yeah. And, and it's such a shame is such a, powerful it can be powerful but just it it's one of the most terrible feelings it's the evil it's the evil of the world (laughs) yeah I agree um well within the you know you kind of touched on just the culture and um drinking being so heavy in the LGBTQI community I mean obviously drinking culture is everywhere (laughs) in the world, right. but especially for your community. Um, I was just reading a little bit more about the Stonewall riots and, and just the fact that like pride was born in a bar. Um, mm-hmm. And and can you speak a little bit about um, and, the Stonewall and riots and pride? Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'd love to hear that. And- and more to speak to that, you know, it wasn't, you know, the fact that it was in a bar. Yeah, I think, you know, the bars became our sanctuaries. Mm-hmm. Those were the only places that we could exist um, in our fullness or even try to, you know. And so the, when they were, you know, they were protesting because back at that time, you weren't allowed to wear like other like you weren't aw- allowed to wear articles of clothing that were not of your gender assigned at birth. And so if you were wearing, I think, more than three items or whatever, you know, the, the cops would do raids and they would come in. And if people weren't, you know, um, were expressing themselves to so like trans people and drag queens and folks who might, um, you know, kind of be a little bit either more butch as a as a female or a little bit more femme as a male, um, then you would get arrested. Um, and so, uh, and they they would usually beat them up. And like the the police were really corrupt and did not treat gay people well. And this wasn't just in New York. It was, uh, you know, there was a the cafeteria riot a year before Stonewall in San Francisco. There was also like a something at a donut shop in LA, I believe that was even before that, but police and the queer community didn't really, they they didn't really see us as people and didn't treat us well. Um, So people just got fed up. And this was back in the sixties. Stonewall was was 69. Mm -hmm. Yeah. June 28th of 1969 for Stonewall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and and more recently at the the Pulse nightclub in uh, Florida, there was the mass shooting. Yeah, yeah. So, do you still see you know, like that being a culture? Like, is it still part of the LGBTQ culture to to be still kind of hidden in in bars and um, drinking and <laughs> What, what is yeah, it like I mean, now? Yes, and, you know, part of it I wanted to speak to, like, that's just how I saw the community at that time. You yeah. Know, I think that's part of, like, as you get older, you can come to understand that there is more than one way to exist as a queer person. Um, I think that's part of the, the problems, too, is that there's only, you know, when you live in a minority group, um, there's only certain narratives that get told to the general public. And then when you access those that narrative, then you think if, oh, if I'm then like that, then this is how I have to act. And these are the things that I do. And these are the places that I go. And, but I mean, 
I, you know, I feel like drugs and alcohol have always been, like I said, like a medicine, a way for me to help cope with life and deal with the difficulties in life. So um, LGBTQ folks are highly, you know, traumatized people. You know, we've been, we've had violence against us, you know, from day one. Like even in, in progressive places, you're still getting called, you're still getting called names or you're losing your jobs or you're, you're really having to think about what it is you're wearing or, or how you're presenting when you go to different places, you know? Um, and that's a lot of stress and that's a lot of anxiety and that's a lot of trauma. And I don't know how else you can expect people to live, um, to take on all of those blows and just be like, okay, you know, like we need something to, cope with how the world treats us treats us yeah and and it's just a collective trauma too yeah Um, so what what um I know that you I saw that you have like a recovery podcast with um a co-host and like Mm -hmm. what what do you think is like what's your message to the community yeah, for us, me and my co-host, Lulu, we are working with a um, the Castro Country Club, which is a local queer kind of sober space for um, for um, queer folks. And uh, we started a podcast a few months ago. And basically, um, our, it's called At the CCC, where there are no outside issues. Um, and basically, we talk about recovery and we talk often about the things that we're told the things that can separate us when we're going through the recovery process, um, whether that's like religion and spiritual spirituality stuff, maybe it has, sometimes it's like gender, um, sexual orientation, race, age, you know, all those sorts of things can play ability can kind of those, the same challenges we have in the world. Also, those sep- potential separations and things can happen in the rooms as well. So we talk a lot about um, just about those sorts, just all any aspects of recovery. Um, we've we've talked about mental health, you know. Um, we've talked about um, spirituality. Um, like my my mind is escaping me. We talked about body stuff, um, you know, because we're talking about recovery, not only just like alcohol and drugs, but also, you know, um, body stuff is really big for LGBTQ folks too. So like a lot of gay and queer men are anorexic and bulimic and have body um, issues, you know, and meth has really become a big um, killer, I would say, in our community. Yeah, and like I've, right now, currently. Yeah, and in general, you know, like in living with HIV and AIDS, I always thought that like I'm, I've met a lot of people who've died of HIV and AIDS and that was a lot, but I've had a lot more of my friends um, die by suicide and overdose. Mm-hmm. Um, and oftentimes, sometimes the the suicide, they're high, you know, like, so is it a suicide? Is it an overdose? Is it both? Um, so it's something that's, that really um, eats at our community. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's tragic and sad. Um, what, yeah. what advice would you give to someone listening I think, you know, if, I think if you're at a place where you're questioning whether your substance use is inhibiting or becoming a problem for you, that there, there probably is, and that there are a lot of ways to, um, to get sober and to, or to begin to have substances impact your life. Uh, in a less harmful way. You know, there's harm reductive uh, processes that people can do where you can begin to slow down use or control use. For some of us, though, we can't really control it. And so abstinence becomes really important. Um, But I think it's, yeah, um, 
I think the biggest thing would be to try to find community. Don't let anyone tell you you're doing it wrong, but be open to doing things different because the reality of it is, is you're seeking different results in life. The only way you can get different results is to do different things. And if you're anything like me, I can't do different things on my own. Like I need help to have a different idea because that's something I could have definitely admitted more than anything else is like, I did not know how to get different results in my life. I just kept getting the diff, the same results that wasn't what I wanted over and over and over again. And I eventually needed to try something different so I could begin to get different results. And it was helpful for me to meet people who, who have, who are living a life differently and maybe a little bit closer to the way that I want to live. If you ever find yourself in recovery spaces and, uh, your gender now, gender pronouns aren't respected or, um, there's certain religious stuff and, you know, like there's a lot of things that are not right. Um, if they're sexist and misogynist and racist and you know, all that sort of stuff can happen in recovery spaces and to, um, try not to let that keep you from, from, you know, getting sober, um, which can be really difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I know like some people will say you can't use medication in getting sober. And I think that that might be something to really consider, um, you know, like do whatever it needs, whatever you need to do to, to, to begin to live a life that feels good for you um, because we deserve it. We deserve to live life with happiness and joy and pleasure and hope. And um, if drugs and alcohol are starting to take that away from us, then, you know, we need to try to find another way to, to have that experience in life that we're meant to have. Wow, that's really beautiful. How, how has your life changed since? Because you, you have been um, substance-free for how long? For 13 years now. Yeah. I just celebrated 13 years, which is a long time, but it feels like 30 in a lot of ways. <laughs> well, you've um, done so much living. Like how, I'm, yeah. how has your life changed? So much. You know, I would say that I, I used to say when I first got sober, I'm gradually becoming the man I always thought I was. Okay. <laughs> then I was able to say, I'm gradually becoming the person I always thought mm -hmm. I was, which I think is integrity, right? And so like, I actually started being able to do the things that I said and be the person who I said I was. Um, and now I think the thing that's really awesome for me, it's like, I am like, live, like I am like living beyond the person I ever thought I could be. Like, like I was selling myself short. <laughs> like I had no clue how, how much more of life that I could have and I could have experience that was just waiting for me, you know, and I never believed I could, I could have certain things or I could experience certain things or be a certain way because of where I grew up or what, where I was now, you know, any of that sort of stuff. So I don't believe that I would be a trans trans person like a living trans person yes. if I didn't get sober and I didn't have spirituality my transness is a spiritual experience for me it is it is so like I feel like my femininity for me my, that's my spirit that's the divine that's within me that I've had to hide my whole life I was never allowed to put it out because if I did I was I was in trouble I could get hurt and I got hurt so many times um so it's beautiful to be in a space in which in a time in which I could just let myself out and um and exist so I mean I don't think I would have been able to um really live into my fullness without you know getting sober um and and you know getting sober was the beginning you know like I've I've had to you know um like you'll learn once you stop drinking and using that now you have like so much life to do and um just 
not drinking and using becomes a little bit easier. Um, and so life can, I don't know, you just can begin to have a life and beyond that. And so it's just like, who knows like where life's going to take me, you know, like I just have no clue. I never would have thought I'd be living in San Francisco. I lived in Chicago for years and mm -hmm. you know, who knows, who knows what's next for me, but I know that it's going to be pretty, pretty awesome if I continue to just kind of, um, like connect with the, the, the divine, the truth, my creator. Like I am now a co-creator in my life. Like I am just not created by all the shit that happened to me. I'm actually getting to create myself along with my higher power, my creator, um, to be, to be whatever the hell I want to be, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's And that's amazing. a beautiful thing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I think the biggest thing is just being able to be a co-creator of my life and my, and who I am is, is a really magical thing because I, I let everyone else and everything tell me who I was and how I could be. And, uh, you know, whether it was getting yelled at or censored for my femininity or it was being called a faggot or it was getting raped or it was getting punched in the face or it was like whatever, like those things created me and they formed me in a way that um, I was a victim to. And I lived, I lived, um, I lived in response to that instead of, um, you know, beyond it, if that makes sense. So I've done a lot of work to heal um, so that I can be a person who, so I can be a healing, a healed person or a healing person who heals others rather than a hurt person who hurts people. Um, at least I can do it a lot less than I used to. Yeah, I um, mean, you sound at peace and empowered. And, now and for you, me, yeah. Yeah, and I think for me, that's what I need to do. Like if I want to not drink or use again, I need to continue to live, live, live the life of, of um, the life that I can dream of, you know, like, and it's not to say that I like, I love who I am. Like I love the fuck out of myself. And I also struggle with myself sometimes and I am really lonely in life. Um, but I also like, I don't know, there's just life, there's just so many like dimensions and I can have some equanimity and I can, I can experience like joy is something within us. I don't, joy is not something that can be taken away. So I can be devastated by not being able to talk with my family about being trans and how much that hurts. And also like be so excited that like my, <laughs> my nipples are starting to like bud. And so they're really sensitive <laughs> and sore and I'm excited about that, you know, and, I can, so I can kind of hold all those things at once and not let, you know, in the past I would have taken my family's inability or my inability to share parts of myself with my family and let that dictate my whole life. And I don't have to do that anymore. You know, that would be something to drink and use over. Wow. Um, and I just, I just don't, I know that that's not the answer for me today. Um, and that I might need to be in a little bit of pain in order to <laughs> be in a whole lot of pleasure. Wow. You are amazing. I, I think I'm pretty okay. Yeah. I, I, I try really hard to be, you know, so I hope I'm successful in being kind and generous and, and uh, you know, grace is my higher power concepts. Um, Grace is the idea of like you don't you just have value and you have worth. You don't you don't get to earn it. You don't have to do anything for it. And there's nothing you can do that's going to take away from it. I that's a really hard for thing for me to really live into. And I believe that in my whole heart. I believe that we're all the same. We all have the same value and the same worth. Um, but I've lived most of my life trying to be exceptional just so that I could kind of still be a little less than everyone else. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I had to work so hard to validate my life and my existence and, 
and I don't, I don't have to, I don't get to, I don't do that anymore, you know? Yeah, you were born with it. You don't have to earn it or prove it. Yeah, and it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to really do, um, to really live that way because our world doesn't. But that's why it's a higher power to me. Mm-hmm. That's why it's the ultimate higher power to me. Because I can't, I can't ever, I can't do it, um, but I can work toward, toward it and, and use it as a, as a guide post to help me show up for myself and the people in my life um, with grace or as close to it as I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, on that note, Bonnie Violet, where, where can people find you? Mm, I think probably a good safe bet is just to look for a queer chaplain. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm on, I'm on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, um, all the places. <laughs> so depending on where you like to consume the things we consume, <laughs> um, you can, um, yeah, you can find me on almost any of those platforms at a uh, queer chaplain. Um, yeah, you might, Bonnie Violet is my newer name, so you might also come across my old name, which is fine. Um, so I think a queer chaplain is probably the best way. And I have a couple of, I have like four podcasts right now, um, that I do, um, that are, are ways that people can connect to. I have a podcast with my aunt who is a conservative Christian, um, And we talk about how it is to be in relationship again because we had been estranged for 20 years. Wow. And we're now in relationship with each other. So we talk about what that's like to have people that are so different and be in relationship with one another. Um, And then I have a podcast where I interview drag queens and trans folks and other folks who are thought to not have spirituality or access to God or some sort of... um, spiritual way of existing and and give them a platform to share what their experience is um, as a drag artist or a trans person or a queer person or an addict and um, talk about their spirituality and how those things can exist. So I try to help people lace their narrative with a spiritual thread. That's wonderful. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on. This was such yeah. a um, delightful and insightful conversation, and I really appreciate you being vulnerable and open and sharing and and just putting out all this good in the world. You, like I said, you are an amazing human being. Well, I hope I was able to <laughs> say something that... that um people can identify with or take something from. And I I really appreciate you um, and your podcast and your um, inviting me to to be on it and to share a little bit of myself um, with, with you and the folks who listen to your podcast. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Alcohol Tipping Point. I'm always here for you guys, so please feel free to reach out and talk to me on Instagram at Alcohol Tipping Point and check out my website, alcoholtippingpoint.com. Again, I hope you can use these tips we talked about for the rest of your week. And until then, see you next time.